Uh, welcome everyone to uh, IWP. My name is Matt Collins. I'm the Dean of Academics here. And I have the great pleasure to uh, introduce Jay Northcutt, from, the little, sorry, from uh, National Review. He, um, I've written a little for National Review myself, and you know when you write for uh, when you write for a publication, you want to think of yourself as uh, your favorite writer. And I'm not my favorite writer of National Review. Jay is long now with Kevin Williamson, so I just uh, He's a, he's a very eclectic writer. He writes on politics. He also is a Renaissance man because he just he will in his impromptus, which he writes for National Review, all of a sudden he, he had, let's talk a little bit about music. So he uh, reviews music, and he's also a music critic critic for the uh, um, um, New Criterion. New Criterion, yes. And uh, but uh, he's here primarily to talk about his most recent book called uh, Children Monsters which uh, is not about the dictators themselves, but about the effect that they've had on their, their children. And I think it's a fascinating study. But he's a good at uh, doing fascinating studies. He also did a book not, not too long ago um, on, the, on the Nobel Peace Prize. So maybe in your question and answer, uh, we can get a sense of who, he, who he's handicapping, you know, who's John Kerry's closest competitor <laughs> for the next, uh, for the next uh, Nobel Peace Prize. Uh, as I say, he writes uh, uh, frequently, and he's, uh, he, he's uh, very prolific, and as I say, very eclectic in his, uh, in his writing. So, um, will you please join me in welcoming our speaker? Thank you, Mac. Yeah, do, do. Thanks a lot. I'm, uh, I'm glad to be here. I'd love to enroll in this beautiful place and study for a bit. I've, um, I've written a, a strange book, as you might gather, but sort of interesting, on the sons and daughters of dictators. And uh, I thought I'd begin by telling you how this book came about. I'll, I'll essentially repeat the first three paragraphs or so of the foreword, so if you read the book, that will spare you the necessity of reading those paragraphs. I was in Albania for the first time in 2002. And I sort of like saying I was in Albania for the first time because it's a boast, you know, who gets to be in Albania once, but I have been back. And uh, I was doing a little speaking there. And Albania had suffered one of the worst dictatorships of the whole 20th century, which is saying something. <clears throat> the dictatorship of Enver Hoxha. There was almost nothing like it on earth. Uh, the Kim Il-sung dictatorship in North Korea was almost certainly the worst dictatorship. But Albania was a lot like that. And the Albanian dictator Hoxha admired Kim a lot. So for about 40 years, Hoxha ran Albania as his personal dungeon. Uh, no one went out of the country. No one came in. It was a place of almost total darkness. Hoxha pervaded this place with a personality cult. In fact, the party, the Communist Party, named him Soul Force, S-O-L-E meaning only, Soul Force. And in Albania, that was pretty much true. So while I was there, I wondered whether Hoxha had had children, because I couldn't imagine being the son or daughter of this man and bearing a last name synonymous with oppression and terror and murder. And I thought, um, could you stay in Albania if you're the son or daughter of Hoxha? Did you change your name? Could you go out? How did people treat you? What was your life like? And so I thought that might make a good magazine piece. And um, magazine writers like me are always looking for their next piece. And a colleague of mine says, you never know where your next meal is coming from. Uh, so I thought the Hoxha kids would make a nice magazine piece. But then I thought, in the next thought, well, you could do a survey of such sons and daughters and make a book of it called Children of Monsters. And I put this idea on the back burner where most of my ideas go, but years later I brought it out and wrote this book, which was an unusual experience. I've written about 20 dictators and their families. I didn't aim for the number 20, which seems like a nice juicy number that you would aim for. I just drew up a list of dictators I wanted to survey, and it came to 20. A couple of the people I would have covered did not have children, and I think specifically of Lenin and Ho Chi Minh. 
I did modern dictators. They're all 20th century. Castro ruled into the 21st. The grandson of one of the dictators is on the throne in North Korea today. The son of another dictator is on the throne of Syria today. You could have gone back to uh, Caligula. He had uh, a child, one child, a daughter. Uh, she was murdered uh, the same day as her parents in, I believe, 41 AD. She was a year and a half years old. Um, how do you say that? Year and a half old? I'll have to study it. Uh, at any rate, she was uh, a kid, a, a very small child, murdered like her parents. Could have gone to Ivan the Terrible in Russia in the 16th century, who killed his own son, also Ivan the Tsarevich, with his scepter in a fit of rage. And immediately was horrified by what he had done. And this moment was immortalized by the Russian painter Repin in the late 19th century. It's just a gripping and horrifying painting. Uh, Bokassa of Central Africa, one of the dictators I study, also killed people with his scepter. It was more like an ebony walking stick. He didn't just beat them, he killed them with it. But he did not kill, to my knowledge, any of his children. He had about 50. So here's what I do, see if this interests you. I, uh, I start with World War II dictators and I throw in Franco. Uh, so I have uh, Hitler, Mussolini, Franco, Stalin, and Tojo. You might wonder what Franco's doing in a book called Children of Monsters. He really doesn't belong there with genocidal dictators like Stalin and Mao and Pol Pot. I'm a little bit embarrassed at the conclusion, at the inclusion of Franco. He's, we are Democrats here with a small d. We wouldn't want to live under any dictatorship, even the most benign. Uh, we believe in liberal democracy. But sometimes in the dictator business, you grade on a curve. And Franco was a lamb uh, compared to these genocidalists whom I also study. Anyway, I included him. He's famous. He had a daughter, and that's interesting. Then in the Far East, I have, uh, after Tojo, I have Mao and Kim. Back in, in Europe, I have Hoja and Ceausescu. Then I go to the Caribbean for Duvalier and Castro. Then three Arabs, Gaddafi, Assad, and Saddam. Then Khomeini and Iran. Four Africans, Mobutu, Bokassa, Amin, and Mengistu. And then I end with a little coda, if you will, on Pol Pot and his daughter. He had a daughter late in life. He was about 60. She got married last year, beautiful young woman, about 30. And believe it or not, she earned a master's degree in English literature. Her father was someone who killed people who wore glasses on the suspicion they might have read something, and that made them dangerous. So obviously, all these sons and daughters have something in common. They're the offspring of a dictator, and that's an unusual fate to share. And so I do make some, I do some general point making and do just a little bit of psychologizing, but not much, because basically these are stories of individuals, and they all cope to their situation in various ways. So um, I might touch a little, I was going to, I won't touch on each family, but I think I might say a word or two on about, well, let's say 13 or 14 of them. And um, we can have questions at the end. If something is unclear, you want to ask something in the middle, go right ahead. Don't be shy. Uh, you may wonder what Hitler's doing in this book, since everyone knows he didn't have children. But um, I begin with Hitler because there was a claimant to be Hitler's son, and he is very interesting. Actually, his mother claimed it. A story goes like this, that Charlotte Lobjois was this 16-year-old French peasant girl during World War I. Uh, she met the soldier, Hitler, uh, one day. They had a brief liaison. A son came of it named Jean-Marie. And she didn't tell this boy, this man, about his parentage, his paternity, until he was 30. That was after the war. He had fought in the French army against German forces, obviously. And so one fine day when he's 30, his mother says, by the way, that, un that German soldier you've always been wondering about who, 
who was your biological father. That was Hitler. That's a fine how do you do. At first he, he denied this within himself. He protested against it. He refused to believe it, but he was tormented by the question, then became obsessed with it, investigated it, became convinced that he was Hitler's son. And uh, most historians believe he was not. But the important thing for me in my little study is he believed himself to be the son of Hitler. What effect did that have on him? And the answer is uh, not good, not good at all. Uh, I also might mention that he looked a lot like Hitler, as does his son, Philippe, a man still living in France. Uh, Jean-Marie is, is dead. I'm afraid that Jean-Marie became quite proud of being Hitler's son or alleged son, and his grandson is proud enough to have two portraits of Hitler on his living room wall. Mussolini had five children officially. He had many children off the books, certainly. A lot of these dictators did. Um, Mussolini had a great, great appetite for women. But he had five official children. Probably Etta is the most famous. Uh, she was the eldest, a legitimate child, you might say. Her parents weren't married at the time, but whatever. Um, they were good socialist revolutionaries, Benito and Raquel, and they didn't believe in marriage. Uh, they later got married for appearances sake and for politics sake. Anyway, Etta is the most famous. She grew up to marry C Count Ciano, who became Mussolini's foreign minister. Uh, Mussolini refused to stay Ciano's execution. And so Etta had the experience of having her father execute or at least decline to stay the execution of her husband. And that's uh, a fine position to be in, and uh, not many people experience it. But several dictators' daughters have. Saddam had two daughters whose husbands were killed by their father, Saddam. Mussolini's youngest son was Romano, who became a jazz pianist. And at first he played under a pseudonym, but then he realized that his name Mussolini was more of a draw than a repellent. So he was Romano Mussolini. He had Romano Mussolini and the All-Stars. That was his band. And he played with Dizzy Gillespie and Duke Ellington and Ella Fitzgerald and all the greats of the day. And he married the sister of Sophia Loren, who was the, probably the most famous person in Italy, Sophia was. And uh, Romano and his wife had a couple of daughters, including Alessandra, who was a politician and the leader of the so-called neo-fascist movement in Italy today. She's a member of the European Parliament. She's been a member of both houses of the Italian Parliament. She's very proud of his, her grandfather. Uh, all the Mussolini children and grandchildren, and I presume great children, great grandchildren, are quite proud of uh, the dictator. But imagine being the granddaughter of Mussolini and the niece of Sophia Loren probably the two biggest figures in the entire Italian 20th century. Stalin had several kids, some official, some unofficial. His first son, Yaakov, led a very sad life. He was basically Jordan, uh, basically a Georgian, excuse me. He lived in Moscow only starting in his mid-teens. He was taken prisoner of war uh, by the Germans his father refused to swap for him the German general who lost at Stalingrad, Paulus. Yakov apparently killed himself by hurtling himself onto an electric fence. Lived a very sad life, tried to kill himself with a gun, failed. His father's remark was he can't even shoot straight. Uh, second son was Vasily, uh, whose mother committed suicide when he was 11. Um, he grew up a perfect little brute who raped and killed and was just a perfect little brute as some of these dictators' sons are. Uh, after Stalin died, he was clapped into prison. He drank himself to death when he was about 40. Svetlana, Stalin's daughter, is the most famous son or daughter of a dictator unless you count the successors, the sons who succeeded their father as dictator. That's two Kims in North Korea, Baby Doc Duvalier in Haiti, and the uh, Assad kid in Syria. Svetlana was famous for a couple of reasons. Uh, she defected sensationally 
to the United States in 1967. Also, she wrote several memoirs. She got it all down, you see. Everything she experienced, everything she saw, she got down. Immortally is my bet. And that's why she is so well known. She lived a tremendously turbulent life. She defected when she had a chance to go to India in late 1966 or early 1967. She walked into the US Embassy and asked for political asylum. And our guy on duty there said, so you say you're Stalin's daughter, the Stalin? And uh, that started her experience of defection. She had a, a daughter while in the United States with Frank Lloyd Wright's chief apprentice. That daughter now manages a vintage clothing and jewelry store in Portland, Oregon. She's a Northwest hipster. She has tattoos, she has a nose ring, the whole nine yards, and is a Buddhist. A little something about Tojo. He had seven children. He was a rather conscientious father. I would say prepared his children for his execution in a very fatherly way. His youngest daughter, youngest child, was a daughter named Kimmy. In the 1950s, she went to the University of Michigan. She lived in the same residence hall as my mother, who had left the year before. Uh, Kimmy married an American became an American citizen. Her name is Kimi Tojo Gilbertson, still living in Honolulu, not very far from Pearl Harbor. You recall that her father attacked Pearl Harbor, launching the Pacific War, the goal of which, from the Japanese side, was to destroy the United States. His daughter is an American citizen who sent me a letter whose return address stamp had the Jefferson Memorial on it. History can be kind of funny. I want to say a brief word about the Kim family, who are not funny in the least. Uh, North Korea is, a, as Jean Kirkpatrick said, a psychotic state. Something very rare in history, a psychotic state. And so there have been three of those Kims. Uh, the first Kim chose Kim Jong-il among his sons. And the second Kim, Kim Jong-il, chose among his sons, the current dictator Kim Jong-un. Uh, they're all monstrous all three of these men. The second two, the son and the grandson, let me just say something maybe lightish, had have a particular predilection for basketball. They love basketball. Kim Jong-il followed the NBA fanatically. Uh, Michael Jordan was his favorite player. When the Secretary of State, Madeleine Albright, visited North Korea, she brought with her a basketball signed by Jordan to give to Kim Jong-il. And um, you may have read in the papers, or whatever people read now, that the Kim Jong-un, the current dictator, has a relationship with Dennis Rodman. Very curious thing. About Hoja, I will only say that his grandson was recently busted, arrested in the Colombian drug operation. He had about $400,000 in cash on him. This is Hoja's grandson. He now faces 20 years. Ceausescu in nearby Romania wanted to begin the first communist dynasty. He was having competition from the Kims. But Ceausescu had three children, and he really wanted to launch the world's first communist dynasty. It wasn't to be because he and his wife, Elena, a kind of co-dictator, fell. They were executed on Christmas Day, 1989. Some people say that everyone has a religion, no matter what. It's interesting, I think, that the dictator went out singing the Internationale, his hymn. I think it was a kind of prayer for him. His wife, Elena, went out cursing their executioners in the saltiest Romanian. And with Ceausescu had three kids, I'll say a little more about them. Duvalier passed his dictatorship to Baby Doc. Duvalier died when Baby Doc was 19. He was the youngest world leader, completely unsuited to dictatorship, completely. He had no interest in politics or politics or really anything but, but girls and motorcycles. People said he was dim, he was an object of sport. The really brainy child was the oldest child, the daughter, Marie uh, Denise. Uh, the old man didn't pass the dictatorship to her. If she'd been of the other sex, she certainly would have been the dictator. Uh, but Baby Doc, if you will, grew into the dictatorship and continued his father's reign of terror. 
although it was a little less terrifying. Well, that's not true. It was significantly less terrifying than the regime of Papa Doc, but it was still awful, absolutely awful. And he was deposed in the mid-1980s. His son, Nicolas, is now an advisor to the Haitian president. Can you imagine that? I doubt there'll be a third Duvalier ruling in Haiti, but uh, you never know. No one knows how many kids Fidel Castro had. Uh, he probably knows, but no one else does. Probably in the neighborhood of 15 with various women. Uh, state media are forbidden to mention his family. Did have five sons uh, with one woman, and their names uh, all begin with A. And several of them are variations on Alexander because uh, Castro loves Alexander the Great, and that was his nom de guerre during the revolution, um, Alejandro. So there are five sons who are sort of, hmm, they're into rigged business, you know, insider business, stuff that dictator sons do. And the Cuban democracy activists finally refer to them as, forgive me, the five a-holes. Um, moving on to Gaddafi. Eight children, seven sons, a gruesome crew, horrible crew, goons, thugs. Three of them died in the Libyan Civil War. Two of them are in prison in Libya. Two of them are in exile in the Gulf. There was one of them, Saif al-Islam, who tried to go straight, so to speak. He very much wanted to be a Western-style liberal, or at least an Arab reformer. He went to several schools in the West. He got a doctorate from the London School of Economics. He always uh, talked about democracy. I met him once at Davos. He said the reason we Arabs have lost all of our wars against Israel is that Israel is a democracy and we are not democracies. So the dictator appoints the worst, least competent general to be the army chief of staff because he's not a threat to stage a coup d'etat. Kind of an interesting observation. Anyway, when the dictatorship came under threat, the family business, Saif went home and fought and killed people, or ordered the killing of unarmed protesters. He's wanted by The Hague for war crimes. He's in prison in Libya. I consider him a tragedy, a dictator's son who tried to go straight, but in the end could not. I think the ties of dictatorship and family and blood, if you will, were too strong. Bashar Assad was not supposed to be the dictator of Syria. That was supposed to be his brother, his elder brother, Basil, who was groomed for it, who seemed made for it. He was handsome, he was glamorous, he was smart, he had the qualities of a leader, people adored him. Uh, when he was quite young, he liked to drive fast cars. He flipped his car, rushing to the airport. It was a foggy morning, he was late for a flight, a Lufthansa flight to Germany, car flipped, he died. And Bashar, the current dictator, was an ophthalmologist practicing eye surgery in London at the Western Eye Hospital. He never was in the slightest bit interested in politics or dictatorship or power. He was shy and bookish. He liked his medical work. He liked to take pictures. He liked black and white photography. He was awkward. He was ungainly. Uh, but he was summoned back to be groomed, to be dictator. Uh, the first time he entered his father's office, he was seven years old. He had just had his first French lesson, and he was so excited about it, he wanted to tell his dad about it. And the next time he entered that office was the day of his father's funeral when he himself was dictator. And as you know, he has, he has kept the family business going in a big way. Saddam had two sons in addition to those daughters I mentioned earlier, Uday and Kuse, uh, memorably called by Senator John McCain, those scamps, those lovable scamps, Uday and Kuse, who terrorized uh, Iraq for years. They were perfect little monsters. They were like Vasily Stalin in the Soviet Union or Niku Ceausescu in Roman Romania. They were perfect little monsters with total license from their father. And uh, Uday was the, the really the, the, the worst of the two. He's just about the most monstrous kid I study. But I thought I would say in these remarks merely that Saddam didn't name a successor, either of the sons. And he, he told his FBI interrogator something interesting after we captured him. 
He said he never wanted his family members to get too close to power because he remembered what had happened to the Sultan of Oman in the early 70s. The Sultan was deposed by his own son. So he always kept people guessing. He didn't want this to happen to him. He was a very, very canny character. And one thing I discovered, for better or worse, in my survey is that these dictators tend to be very, very bright in addition to ruthless. They're certainly street smart. They are very cunning. Saddam Hussein was very, very smart. So was Stalin. You often hear that Stalin was on top because he was the most ruthless. Not true. They were all ruthless. No one's more ruthless than his Lieutenant Beria, believe me. Stalin was unfortunately extremely, extraordinarily smart. These are brainy people, these dictators. And that's one reason they seize power and a reason that they keep it until they fall. And of course, they're ruthless as well. Khomeini had five children, really, whom we know about. Two sons, each served as lieutenant to his father. Three daughters. I thought I might mention one of the grandchildren. There are lots of grandchildren. This kid, now grown man, middle-aged, maybe older, named Hussein. And he is a genuine liberal Democrat. Uh, when the United States and its allies overthrew Saddam in 2003, 2004, this young man, Hussein, moved to Iraq and called for something similar to happen in his own country, Iran. He called for the overthrow of the dictatorship that his grandfather established by force of American arms if necessary. He came to the United States, he came to this town, Washington, spoke at AEI, but in early January 2004, his grandmother, Khomeini's widow, summoned him home urgently because there had been threats, physical threats, against the family by the regime because of what Hussein Khomeini was doing. And so he returned home and has been under house arrest ever since. Who's next? I think I go to Africa next for Mobutu, who had lots of children, maybe about 17. He called his country Zaire. Uh, just a name he invented or adopted for the duration of his rule. Uh, one of the sons was nicknamed Saddam Hussein. And the reason that he was the enforcer, he was the thug, he was the real brute on the staff, if you will. Bokassa of Central Africa, he was certainly one of the most ghoulish and heinous dictators. As, as I said, he beat people to death with his own hands or his own walking stick or a scepter. And uh, many of his children, he had about 50, were traumatized. And almost none of them has lived what you might call a happy life. And they are far flung throughout the world. Idi Amin had 60 children, a cool 60, 21 different mothers. Imagine this span. The first Amin child was born in 1948, about. The last one was born in the mid-1990s. That's a heck of a career. And he was a kind of jolly, lovable father to his children. They called him Big Daddy. He was strict at times, but he was also fun-loving. Uh, in exile in Saudi Arabia, he would take them on family shopping expeditions to, to Safeway. And they would race through the aisles with their carts. Also, Idi Amin's favorite food on earth was Kentucky Fried Chicken. They had an outlet in Jeddah, and he loved it. And he has one son who is an interesting character, Jafar. I interviewed him at length. He is an interesting mixed bag. I, I admire him, actually. Jafar, on one hand, is an apologist for his father and his dictatorship. And Idi Amin was just a cold-blooded killer, understand, a real killer. Um, and so he's a whitewasher and an apologist. On the other hand, he has moments of clarity and confession, and even, I think, some remorse. And he leads reconciliation efforts in Uganda. And he's very, he's open to all comers, people like me. This is very rare among sons and daughters of dictators, and I do admire him. Mengistu is called the Stalin of Ethiopia. He, that's a very good name for him. And when he was deposed, he went to Zimbabwe under the protection of Robert Mugabe. Uh, the Mengistus had three children. Uh, the eldest, a daughter, is a doctor. Otherwise, we know very little about the children of the Mengistus in exile. They are forbidden by the Mugabe government to speak to anyone. And they have really kept their heads down. 
By the way, I could have included Mugabe, but didn't. I, I didn't think that he, his, his, his body count wasn't high enough for inclusion in my book. But uh, some of the experts will have to tell me, maybe you know, Mac, but Mugabe's 90-something and still very much in charge of the country. I wonder if there's ever been a national leader. I'm not talking about kings and queens and ceremonial roles. I wonder if there's ever been a national leader that old. I, I, that's a couple of minutes of Googling might tell us. But it's just extraordinary how long he has hung on to power. And I did mention Pol Pot. He had two wives. Uh, the first team, I love this because you know the Khmer Rouge all studied in Paris with the Marxists <coughs> at the Sorbonne. And he married his first wife on Bastille Day in Cambodia, kind of their holy day. She later went mad. I think she was schizophrenic. Pol Pot divorced her. In the jungles after the Khmer Rouge fell, he married again a much younger woman who was a Khmer Rouge worker. Uh, she was called a porter. And they had a child. Pol Pot was about 60, 61, a girl. She was 12 when he died. He treated her very tenderly, very affectionately. This was a man, remember, who with his gang killed between a quarter and a third of the Cambodian population. And uh, she went on, as I said, to earn a, a master's degree in English literature in Malaysia. She was married last year, and by the look of the photos and from the descriptions, it was a beautiful wedding. And she lives among a Khmer Rouge remnant in a Khmer Rouge redoubt in rather remote Cambodia. She's a kind of Khmer Rouge princess, and she reveres the memory of her father. Uh, whether she has doubts about what he did, well, she hasn't confessed them, uh, at least to our knowledge. So I thought I'd make a couple of just general points now. Some people say, what about nature nurture? What did your study tell you about that? Well, I try not to generalize too much, and I think of the example of the Ceausescu brothers. So there were two brothers, Valentin and Niku, and Niku was a perfect little monster. He swaggered and raped and murdered his way through Romania. He had complete license, and he exploited that license as far as he could go. He was a kind of evil king of this country, or, or prince, more like it, and no one was safe around him. Valentin, as far as I know, never harmed a hair on anyone's head. He lived blamelessly, honorably. He became a physicist. He wanted nothing to do with dictatorship or power. He has worked at the same institute on the outskirts of Bucharest for decades. He gives very few interviews. He's very quiet. He has a circle of friends, sort of a bookish fellow. What does that tell us about nature nurture? I'm not really sure. Um, Etta Mussolini, as I mentioned, had the experience of having her husband killed, executed by her father, so the two of Saddam's daughters. Papa Doc wanted to kill the husband of one of his daughters. He didn't quite do it, thanks to the pleas of his daughter and his wife, and he very much regretted that he did not kill this man. There are a couple of other close calls as well. I'll give you the, the, the brutes, the little monsters in the image of their father. I think of Vasily Stalin, Niku Ceausescu, three or four of the Qaddafi boys, depending on how you count, at least two of the Assad boys. By the way, Bashar's brother Maher is his right hand and just a beastly man. Saddam's two sons, and then the Mobutu child who was nicknamed Saddam Hussein. The Khomeini sons, as I mentioned, were both lieutenants to their father, the Imam. The successors, remember, are Jean-Claude Duvalier, or Baby Doc, Kim Jong-il, Bashar, and Kim Jong-un. Some might have become dictator if their fathers had hung on to power. Surely a Qaddafi would, there were about three or four sons vying for succession in Libya. Some of the others as well. I have a category of children you might call normal people. Carmen Franco was a nor normal person. Romano Mussolini, the jazz pianist, was kind of normal. Uh, most of the Tojo children have behaved with great dignity, although there's a Tojo grandchild who became a terrible apologist for Japanese nationalism and fascism and I think embarrassed the family. Uh, a couple had doubts and almost broke out from the dictatorial orbit. I mentioned Qaddafi's son Saif. Um, the Ceausescu's daughter Zoya 
had moments of doubt when she went to college. She saw how ordinary people lived. Uh, her boyfriend had to go to the hospital once. People were sharing beds. Uh, there wasn't much to eat. Uh, she said she didn't want to be called Ceausescu anymore. She said, call me Mademoiselle. But in the end, she was loyal. Two of the children defected, Svetlana Stalin and one of Castro's daughters, went to Miami in the 1990s. She escaped with a wig and a false passport. And she wrote a brutally honest book about her father and herself. There's a lot of denial, I think, I know, that goes on with these sons and daughters of dictators. They have to deny things. I think it helps to keep them from going mad, really. Uh, Solzhenitsyn's slogan was, live not by lies. It wasn't so much a slogan as an admonition, a piece of advice. And, but most of these sons and daughters, I think, do live by lies. They have to in order to keep their sanity. While I was writing my book, I, I mentioned this in my afterword. I live in New York, and uh, there are often posters for Broadway shows. And I saw a poster for the show Jersey Boys. And the slogan, the tagline was, everyone remembers it the way he needs to. And I think that's true of a lot of these sons and daughters. Maybe it's true of people in general. But I especially admire uh, the ones who do not live by lies and who face up to the truth, even if it hurts a lot and costs them something. I also had to face the question, um, how much slack should you cut these sons and daughters? You know, a lot of them are in hideous positions, but they do hideous things. And I was talking one day while I was writing my book to uh, my friend Ignat Solzhenitsyn, who's a pianist and conductor, and one of the three sons of the great man. And we were talking about the Stalin kids in particular. And it occurred to me that Vasily Stalin uh, is Ignat's exact counterpart, in that Vasily was the son of the worst man in the history of the Soviet Union, and the Solzhenitsyn boys are the sons of the best man, probably, in the history of the Soviet Union. But neither side chose its fate, if you will. It was just, it just happened. Now that doesn't mean I excuse Vasily Stalin because people do have choices and uh, some make better choices than others. And he lived a terrible life and he hurt a lot of people. But I also remember that this is a kid, first of all, he's born Joseph Stalin's son. That, that's to begin with. His mother kills herself when, she, uh, when he is 11. And Svetlana was raised by a, a nanny one nanny in particular, a very warm, loving woman, which helped her a lot. Vasily was essentially raised by the old man's uh, bodyguards, the, the hardest, toughest men in the whole NKVD. And so it would have been pretty hard to turn out non-vicious, I would say. Uh, I thought in this book about you know, questions of loyalty. Uh, it's natural, I think, to love and admire and be loyal to your parents. but. Um, John Kennedy said, sometimes party loyalty asks too much, and sometimes family loyalty may ask too much. Uh, what if your father, to whom you wish to be loyal, is a brute who kills thousands, or tens of thousands, or hundreds of thousands? What then? It's sort of a hard thing to deal with. And the final thing I'll say before asking for questions, I thought this question might come up. And I asked myself these questions and answered them in my afterword. Uh, who is the best father and who is the worst father? Who is the best child and who is the worst child? Uh, best father, I think you might say Franco, although oh, that's kind of cheating. He probably doesn't belong in my book in the first place. He had one daughter whom he adored and doted on, and she loved him, and they were very, very close. Uh, Tojo, as I mentioned, was a quite conscientious father, um, and, who, and whose children uh, loved and respected and admired him. He seemed to care about fatherhood. Most of these guys don't, of course. Uh, the worst father, this is, I think it's one giant tie. Uh, a lot of them bruise their kids in a number of ways. Bokasa imprisoned a couple of his kids. But there's, there's something about Mao that stands out, that his, his evil was a kind of chilling, cold evil that makes him less human somehow than, than Saddam, for example, who had a volcanic temper. You can almost relate to Saddam as a human being, an extreme human being, and a beastly murderous human being, but a human being with human emotions. Ma was almost devoid of normal human feelings, and that somehow makes him maybe the most chilling of the dictators. Uh, best child or children, I much admire the defectors. 
uh, Svetlana Stalin and the Castro daughter, Alina Fernandez. They were very, very brave, very brave. And uh, Jafar Amin is doing good work, some good work in Uganda, I would say. Uh, I would say the worst child is um, Uday Hussein. It's, it, he's hard to top. Then I remember the, the sons who succeeded their father as dictator. Can we really say that, that, that Uday is worse than Bashar or Kim Jong-un? Um, probably not. So I try to be somewhat sympathetic in my book because these people are in a very peculiar position. And I just, I just go back to that guy who, whose mother said that he was Hitler's son. What would you do? You, you've always wondered who your father was. You were taunted in school as a fils de Bush, which is a very rude way of saying son of a German soldier. And you always wondered who this guy was. And you're 30 years old. The war is over. You fought in it. Your mother says, oh, by the way, it was Hitler. That's just a, that's a card that's dealt to very, very few of us. And uh, I learned, I learned a, a lot in doing this book, I think, about dictatorship and tyranny and the stuff people have to cope with. But I must say I was very glad to be done with the book. Uh, it, it's a gruesome subject, although there are moments of uplift and inspiration, and I think one learns something. So I've gone on enough, and thank you so much for listening, and um, let's hear from you. Thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, thanks a lot for forming, Mr. Mosner. I uh, woke up to uh, uh, an NPR package on your, uh, on your book a couple weekends ago, and uh, I couldn't wait to come here and listen to the form. Oh, so okay. I actually do have a couple of questions. Sorry, I know it's but uh, I'll be right back in. Could you um, uh, go sort of gold, silver, and bronze? Yeah. The, you know, the, the worst, basest little monsters. Um, would it be Kim Jong Un? who presides over a terror state and knows better having grown up in, in Switzerland, or is it, uh, by way of a very s close second, uh, Bashar al-Assad, who, uh, who's a bane to anyone who isn't um, an ally. And, um, and the second question is, what is this obsession, maybe it's self-evident, uh, with the Godfather? You know, Saddam loved it, a number of other people will enjoy it. But highly ironic, considering the Godfather's who's over it, not the film, but the, the, the book, is a treatise on America. And thanks, man. And I, I didn't so gold, go, gold, silver, and bronze. Yeah. I like your ranking. I like your gold and silver. Let's give Uday the bronze. Uh, he was, by the way, in charge of the Libyan Olympic Committee. Uh, tortured athletes or killed them when he, he thought they didn't perform well enough. Uh, lots of dictator sons are involved in sports, by the way. Gaddafi has had such a son. Vasily managed or ran the Air Force sports teams. Uh, there, there lots of stories about sports in my book. Uh, the Godfather, that's a very interesting thing. Um, I mean, they people, love it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think probably because it's a story of people doing illegitimate things lawless things, but they're human beings, and it's a family drama. Also, I think people like to sort of imitate these people. And, and some of the ones who aren't on top as the capo, they aspire to be on top. Uh, Hitler loved to see the uh, Wagner opera Rienzi, and he dreamed of imperial power, and did that from a fairly young age, and he achieved it. And I quote my friend, the historian David Price Jones, to whom this book is dedicated, by the way. We were lucky that Hitler had a streak of craziness within him. Because if he had been less crazy, for example, in his assault on the Soviet Union, he might very well have pulled it off. We lucked out in a way that he had this streak of craziness. If he'd been a little more cunning, a little more rational, if he'd played a cooler hand, who knows? It could have turned out much worse. Well, thank you so much. This is a fabulous book. I can't wait to read it. I am curious if you had a question for somebody who had a psychological lens. What would you ask? I thought about this. Um, bear with me a second. Do you know how people say of certain cartoons that, that uh, they work on different levels? 
for example, um, children like them because of the physical antics and the sounds and so on, and they laugh. And adults appreciate them uh, because of these inside humor, maybe some sexual things or political things. This was said of Rocky and Bullwinkle, and it was said of it's said of The Simpsons, for example. My book, it can be read as um, just a collection of stories, life stories, fairly sensational stories, but fascinating and all too fascinating lives, sketches. It can be read that way, little biographical sketches. It can also be thought of psychologically. You can explore themes and, and patterns. You can draw points about loyalty and fatherhood and sonship or daughtership, all of this stuff. You know this expression I think President Obama used once, above my pay grade? Just as soon as I went to, and I do, do some generalizing in my afterward in particular, but as soon as I went to do some generalizing, I could contradict it with another example. So therefore, I, 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 would, I would say I'm modest in this book. Other people might say it's a dereliction of duty. In fact, one reviewer did say that, that I should have, should have drawn broader and stronger psychological points. I didn't know how, because they're, they really live individual lives. They have the common fate of being the son or daughter of a dictator, but then they live individual lives. And, and the starkest, starkest example is those, um, those two Ceausescu boys. So I had a long interview with Milt Rosenberg, who taught psychology at the University of Chicago for years. And he had some interesting things to say about this book. And I could have done more of that kind of thing, but I think I really would have been talking. I would have been stretching or kind of posing, because I'm not really sure. I do think that Svetlana lucked out with her nanny. She said so. Maybe I can find a page in my book. And you know, Vasily was raised by those, by Stalin's henchmen. And Svetlana says something so tender and so moving in, in one of her books. And um, I think I can find it in just a second. I think I've Almost, yeah, yeah, she says, this nanny, Alexandra Andreevna, excuse me, Andreevna, uh, was dearer to me than anyone on earth if it hadn't been for the even steady warmth given off by this large and kindly person, I might long ago have gone out of my mind. And I believe that's true, and Svetlana was crazy enough as it was, trust me. That's a good segue to my question, I was wondering if the the idea of nurture versus nature is a natural question when we talk about this topic in your analysis is it's very thoughtful. I'm wondering whether you saw any difference between the outcome of the children based on the role of a mother hmm. figure, uh, whether that as sort of some sort of warmness led to a different path or whether it was, as you suggest, sort of different lives and different, uh, different things. What a good question. Um, the mothers? I'll speak generally. The mothers raised the children. The fathers saw the children pretty rarely, but on sort of ceremonial occasions, they'd swoop in, say there was a crisis, a hospitalization, a birthday or something, whatever it was. Um, and so that made the children revere the father all the more because of his very remoteness. I think a lot of these children barely knew their father, but they treasured every encounter. And um, the mothers were often overruled by the husband, the dictator, the father. And, but in the case of the Stalins, um, uh, Nadia, Stalin's second wife, thought that her husband coddled their two children, was too soft. And I think I say in my book, imagine a household in which Stalin is the more loving parent. She was a very cold woman. She was a Bolshevik who was devoted to party and thought that motherhood and parenting and family, these were kind of bourgeois things that were counter-revolutionary. And Svetlana said she could not recall that her mother had ever hugged, kissed, or praised her. Um, all the Mussolini children say in the same line that their mother was the real dictator in the family. And she was. And by the way, if I may say something about Rachele, it's often said that she tolerated her husband's affairs like a good dictator's wife, a good Italian wife. It just went with the territory. It was no big deal. But I can tell you that when she found out about Claretta Petacci, uh, the mistress with whom Mussolini was killed, she swallowed bleach, and she was saved by a maid who found her. 
and called a doctor. So she was not that stoic, at least not on that day. Uh, I think I think she did care. Yeah, I was wondering how many of these children educators benefited from um, American foreign policy and aid. I, I, it comes to mind that uh, uh, Pol Pot and the Rouge uh, sought safe haven in Thailand and in China and were provided covertly assistance from the United States, who felt that since the Vietnamese had ousted them from Cambodia, that this was a natural ally that should be funded for a matter of time through the refugee camps, through covert action, through reconstituting the Khmer Rouge into a force to evict the uh, Vietnamese forces from Cambodia. And I, I was thinking that she may have benefited from that. Are there any others who may have benefited in this post-dictator period besides Pol Pot? Well, um Mobutu received a lot of American largesse, uh, Bokasa, others, uh, a, a former ambassador to the Central African Republic or Central African Empire, as Bokasa styled it when he crowned himself Emperor Napoleon style. Our ambassador there told me a story that uh, we had become exasperated with Bokasa. He was killing too many people. He killed school children in particular who had protested because they had to buy a uniform that was too expensive for them to afford. And so our ambassador had this heart-to-heart -heart meeting with Bokasa. Uh, Bokasa had been in a drunken rage. And Bokasa said, uh, Nixon resigned, didn't he? Yes. And he's living in California now? Yes. He's getting along okay? Yes. He said, I could never do that. We in Africa don't do that. He said, I just can't. I have to hang on. And he did hang on until um, he was ousted. He lived in exile a long time and went back to face trial. But yes, um, we Americans were entangled with a good number of these dictatorships. It's true. Right, right behind you first, yeah. Well, it's interesting, this one, this one daughter, Ragad, she is under the protection of King Abdullah II in Jordan. She's lived in Amman for years now. She lives a very high life. Uh, she terrorizes, if you will, the clerks in boutiques, the fanciest shops. She's had a lot of plastic surgery. She has her own jewelry line. Uh, she is wanted by Interpol. Uh, she has indeed funded ISIS. And uh, she is known as uh, Little Saddam. She's a keeper of her father's flame, the tender of his legacy. She's very proud, looks a lot like Saddam. And, and Saddam killed her husband. Two of Saddam's daughters married two brothers who were Saddam's cousins. This is gonna be hard to follow. Saddam's sons were jealous of the, the cousins and brothers-in-law and thought that Saddam loved them too much. The brothers-in-law thought that Uday and Kusay had reached the point where they could kill them with impunity. They fled with their families to Jordan under the protection of King Hussein. They stayed there for about a half a year. Saddam's wife came to assure them they could have safe passage home, things would be okay, come home. They went home, the sons-in-law were almost immediately killed by Saddam and his forces. Now the daughters, I can't even imagine. Over time, rather like Edda Mussolini, they grew defensive of their father in his act. And I just think reinterpreted, reinterpreted it the way they had to. And Ragad Hussein, one of the daughters said in an interview that her father was dearer to her than, not only than her husband, but her children as well. And the thing about the, these sons and daughters who revere their father, they grew up in this personality cult. And, and other people around them 
in the dictatorial orbit worshipped the great man too. Svetlana says in one of her memoirs that she never heard her father's name mentioned without such words as great and wise attached to it, ever. And also some of them, the dictators long gone, they live among a remnant, a, a coterie of hardcore supporters, and also younger people who are nostalgic for this dictatorship they never knew, or have notions about the dictatorship, especially when current times are hard. They always have support. When Alessandro Mussolini runs for office, people come up and give her the fascist salute, not in mockery, but in all sincerity, and ask her to sign things, sign pictures of, of Mussolini. There's an appetite out there. There's always a little remnant or a core, and these sons and daughters tend to be surrounded by it. And so they're cocooned, and they can live with these illusions. I think it's in part to keep their sanity. A lot of them are very rich, as you mentioned, very, very rich, and some of them are destitute. Bocasa had a child named, get this, Charlemagne, who died homeless in the metro system in Paris. Terrible life. And others of them are rolling in it still. Um, have you thought about doing the book on the sons and daughters of democratic leaders to do a kind of fair trial? Yeah. Someone said, do, uh, Bill Bennett said you should do um, sons and daughters of saints. He said, I have a, he said, I have a son who's always telling me, he said, Dad, you hit it big with a, a, a book called The Book of Virtues. You should write the book of vices. It'll sell better. <laughs> and so he said, you might consider doing the opposite. I would like to do a book, um, I've written a lot about dissidents and political prisoners. I would like to write a book called Brave Lives uh, that sketches many of these. So uh, that would be, um, there'd still be a lot of awfulness in it, but these are heroic people. Well, the great Arab political scientist, Eli Kadouri, gave my friend David Price Jones a piece of advice decades ago. <coughs> Keep your eye on the corpses, he said. Body count. Um, how many people are these sons killed? It's always sons, by the way, who do the killing. Uh, that, that's how I judge. And the others, you really, it's a lot of grading on a curve. By the way, you remind me that um, some people have asked me in interviews, has there ever been a female dictator? I say that um, let's not count queens from antiquity in the Middle Ages and onward. Let's leave them to one side. They really, and unless you, which would be stretching it, unless you count it a relatively brief period that Indira Gandhi had so-called emergency rule, there really hasn't been. It's a man's business. Yeah. You stated that um, Pasha al-Assad was uh, bookish and shy. He was an optometrist in London. Ophthalmologist. Ophthalmologist. Mm -hmm. Up until the, he uh, would want me to correct that. Yeah. If, he, if he were here, he'd say, please. <laughs> Remember what Dr. Evil says in one of the movies, Austin Powers movies, when he's at a PTA meeting? <laughs> and I think the teacher says, now, Mr. Evil, do you have something to say? He said, I didn't go through six years of evil medical school to be called Mr. <laughs> <laughs> so. so now, Bashar al-Assad goes back to Syria and he assumes office. In his tenure, uh, do you think that he's morphed into a proper dictator, or is he still just being manipulated by uh, his court? and he's still no. that shy guy? No, 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 he's grown into the role. I mean, he's killed more than the old man ever dreamed of killing. He's keeping the family business going. His defense, and I almost choke on these words, in Syria, as in the Arab world more broadly, there is an aspect of kill or be killed, and if he falls, it'll probably mean the massacre of his fellow Alawites. That is something to consider but he has done the absolute necessary to keep the family in power, to keep the Ba'ath Party in power. It's true that he was a reformer early on. For about a year and a half, he did some liberalizing. For example, the first independent magazine opened uh, since the early 1960s, I think it's since 1963, uh, established by this famous and brave cartoonist, Ali Ferzat. It was called, I think, Al Dumani, I think, the Lamplighter. And um, he, there was a loosening for about a year and a half, and people were very excited to have this young Assad on the throne, so to speak, and 
he'd been part of life in London, and he, he liked um, um, Phil, sorry, who's the English rocker? Phil Collins. You know. Remember said when, when Andropov took over in the Kremlin, everyone said that he liked to listen to Glenn Miller and drank scotch, and this meant he was a human being. He'd been the head of the KGB. But there was a little liberalizing, and then he cracked down. This is before the Arab Spring, uh, with the aid of his very thuggish brother, Maher. And then uh, when the Arab Spring came in, I think it came to Syria in, I want to say, March 2011, he did the necessary. He's actually flattened the country, and the country is emptied out. Emptied out. They're all in exile or dead. It, oh, it's hard to say that Syria is really a country anymore. I realize this is not the subject of my book, and I'm going off here. But I remember noting in my column the death toll in Syria. And it was nearing 10,000. 10,000, mind you. There's climbing, you know, 4,000, 6,000, 7,500. So, you know, good Lord, it's nearing five digits. I couldn't imagine this. Five digits. I couldn't imagine 10,000. It's not that populous a country, really. And then after 10,000, I stopped counting. I stopped looking. It is really one of the worst episodes of modern times. We have witnessed the nearly the physical destruction of a people. Forget the monuments. Anyway, cheery stuff, I know. John? I'm curious where the majority of the children of monsters lie. I think it's clear they don't lie with Svetlana in the defector column. Um, but I'm curious whether or not they lie in the middle or on the embrace and then emulate the brutality of their fathers. Middle. Middle, for sure. Yeah. Well, I'm sure the embrace and emulate get the headline. Yes, yes, definitely. Quick question. You are an expert at interviewing people and dealing one on one with people. I'm curious if you had any reflections when you interviewed the mon any of the monsters. It, 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 it's a very dicey thing. And so someone said to me, How did you approach them? <laughs> and I tended to say things like, I'm writing a book about the sons and daughters of men such as your father. Okay. Okay, a lot of them believe that their, you know, their dads were heroes, or the Hoja children think that Emperor Hoja was a true Democrat, their words. The idea that their father was a dictator is offensive to them. So they have to walk on eggshells. Uh, Jafar Amin was very, very open. Others weren't. Even Kimi Tojo Gilbertson didn't want to talk to me. It was just too terrible. She wanted to let it go. And now she's an old Japanese-American lady living in Hawaii, like a lot of other old Japanese-American ladies, and she wants to be kind of indistinguishable. I understand that. I have a, a, quick, a quick one. Rule of law. We all believe in rule of law. That's one of those other phrases that we all love and adore. And we're talking about bad guys in this, in this book. Uh, why is it, now that they're international judges and UN judges, and I don't even know the names of all of the people that are judges, why do we always get the black dictators and send them to wherever the hell you try them, Addis Ababa or the UN, and they don't lay hands on white dictators? or maybe even, to be cynical, some that we kind of like or use to get the bad guys. Well, they laid hands on Milosevic. And uh, I'd, have to, I'd have to think for a second. Bill Buckley would say, that question's like Peking duck, requires 24 hours notice. Um, can't, can't lay hands on Mengistu. He's been safe in his Zimbabwean stronghold since 19, I can't remember, probably most of his life at this point. Couldn't lay a hand on Amin, who had a happy life driving around in his Chevy Caprice Classic in Jeddah. The Enrolled his sons in a PLO military facility. The corollary to that question is, isn't it better to get the bad guy to go away? Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Now, I'm, I'm criticized always. I was the ambassador when that great Al Avars, Alfredo Stresner, mm. General Stresner, 32 years, yeah. was sent to Brazil. He wanted to go to Coral Gables. I made sure he went to Brazil. But I'm getting criticized by my dear friends down there in Foggy Bottom about 
gee whiz, why didn't you grab them and da -dum -da -dum -da -dum and send them? No, I, I've letter. changed my mind on that in adulthood. I've, I've definitely changed my mind on that. I'm with you. Do what it takes to get them gone. And it might have to forego the emotional satisfaction of justice. Set them up in some nice villa. I, 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 I know when, when I was younger, I wanted them properly tried. Uh, but the other way is better. Also, I'm, these international tribunals are for the birds. This one, the Khmer Rouge trials in uh, Phnom Penh are, are essentially a joke. I did sort of a study of them. Um, maybe it's better to go the Truth and Reconciliation Commission route. I never liked that. I thought it, I thought it let the butchers off too easy. Uh, but it's maybe better because, look, these guys, these Khmer Rouge genocidalists, they're just dying in bed like Pol Pot. These things go on and on. Are you exhausted? What, one for the road, so to speak? One for the road. Um, well, I mean, given the activists, how do, you regard, how do you regard the international state system um, and, and the fact that in places where the United States has you know, serious assets and, and uh, uh, true interests, uh, that these are regions and, and principalities, essentially, that are governed by really, really bad people and mm. their projects? I think you do your best. And sometimes in foreign policy, you have to hold your nose. And diplomacy is not a great place for moral absolutism. I myself am an, am an absolutist. And I think I'd sort of be bad at the job because there are all sorts of compromises. Just think, take it down to my level. I was selecting dictators for my book. Uh, you and I wouldn't have wanted to live under the Shah in Iran because you and I are good Democrats. But compared to Khomeini, my goodness. I think what goes on in Evan prison now, which, which the, the Shah built. So there's a lot of this grading on a curve, and there's a lot of nose holding, and I would like to bust them all. Uh, but the world's very, very messy, and I understand. Uh, look, the, the Saudis are our great allies, and um, I've talked to a lot of people in our government about the Saudis and what they bring to us, and I acknowledge that this alliance is important. But holy moly, they beat the stuffing out of dissidents in that country. Pe people say, oh, women can't drive in Saudi Arabia. Oh, that's the least of it. Who cares whether women can't drive? You know what they do to these people in prison? Goodness, being denied a driver's license is like a wet kiss compared to what these people do. So I'd like to bust them all. My girlfriend My calls uh, them the least worst state. Um, do you agree? The, Saudi the Saudis? The Middle East, if, if I had to live, if I had to be a citizen of the Middle Eastern, an ordinary citizen, not, not part of the, one of the privileged, I suppose I would go to Jordan, which itself is not a picnic. Uh, some legislators found out when they issued some mild criticisms of the government and found themselves in cells. But grading on a curve, yes. Thank you so much, you all. Thank you, Jay. Appreciate it. Thank you very much, and thank you all for coming. And I hope we'll be back. And by the way, I should have said, if you want to ask something, you want to contact me, I'm findable at National Review. I'm just, it's the most boring email address in the world, jnordlinger at nationalreview.com. Write me anytime.